Hello, this is Thomas Coyer. And this is Sarah Coyer. And we'd like to welcome you to episode 38 of the HealthWise Report, the audio edition. This time, it's not just me and Sarah. We have a guest with us. His name is Brian Humphreys. We met him some years ago. He's from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but this Bethlehem is not the holy kind. No, far from it, but it does have Brian. But we do have Brian. He's a good guy. He's one of the good ones. Some years ago, he contacted us for assistance with a health problem. It wasn't for his health, however. It was for his mother, Virginia. In the case of Virginia, it was probably the toughest case we ever took. And it's one of the few cases where we lost. And what I mean by losing, I meant we lost the patient. It was a case in which she had already had too much, quote, help from the medical establishment. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, she and Brian found us too late. Yeah. But I do believe that while working with Brian, with all of us working and studying and trying to figure out what we could do for Miss Virginia that we were able to extend her life and improve the quality of her life for a while, but we came into the game too late. It was just too much damage done. Brian did the best he could prior to meeting up with us, and he actually did a fairly good job, especially in the later years. He did his own research and did surprisingly well. She had been in a tailspin for a long, long time. Yeah, and this is a story, his story and Virginia's story, that I think a lot of people need to hear. And in some ways, it's replicated. uh, Yeah, it's a common story. Yes. Brian hasn't even said anything yet, has he? No, he hasn't. It's just been us babbling on. Uh, Welcome to the show, Brian. Yeah, hey, Brian. Well, I'm here, and I'm pleased to be here. Okay. (laughs) I'm glad we we were giving you a chance to get a word in. We will later, of course. I'm sorry about that, Brian. Brian is something of a partner to us. He does what we can't do, and we do what he can't do. He's a seller of colloidal silver, which is an alternative medicine that goes way back. At one time, it was a mainstream medicine. Over time, the history was rewritten. Now it never happened. But if you go back and look at the old medical books, it was a medicine. Oh, absolutely. And the trouble is that due to current FDA regulations, Brian can't talk about what colloidal silver does, who should use it, any of that. Because he sells it. Right, exactly. And if, he's, and if he does, while selling it, he's selling an unapproved drug, making unapproved medical claims about it. Yeah, That's and, what they say. Yeah, and it's imperative that we do distribute that information. And as a result, we can't sell it. Also, as a result, Brian can't really tell everybody what he needs to say. So while on this call with Brian, there may be times when he just can't say anything. He just has to go quiet because we're talking about the medical value of the product he sells. And... Quite frankly, in public, he can't agree with us. Even if he really does, he can't vocalize that without getting into serious trouble. Yeah. And we were glad to have found him because we think it's important for really, really high-quality colloidal silver to be out there for people. In alternative medicine, it's the nuclear weapon. It's what works when nothing else will. That's true. And it's kind of sad that other than Brian... We haven't been able to find any other colloidal silver seller that we could actually trust. We know we could trust him because we actually worked with him in formulating and perfecting his procedure. All three of us spent years researching and talking about and studying and doing test results, etc., etc., to where all of us eventually knew the subject backwards and forwards. Yeah. Brian, to his credit, really has become known for his diligence. He doesn't cut any corners. Yes, diligence to the point of fanaticism at the times. Well, yeah, yeah, we, we do pick on him sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but seriously, he takes it very seriously. Very, and... very seriously. This came as a result of his own battle with the establishment. Essentially, his own battle to save his mother from the establishment, what it had done to her. I'd like Brian to just go ahead and tell us how it all began. It really is an interesting story, and as Sarah said, one that needs to be told. Well, my mother was sick for a long time before she passed away, and her condition did nothing but get progressively worse over time. Before she got sick, she really was quite healthy, at least she appeared to be. She had always had a healthy lifestyle, I think definitely above average as far as her personal habits, her eating habits, and her general health. 
Sickness was something that was practically unheard of, certainly not any major ailment. But all of a sudden, one day, she got very sick. There, there was a definite beginning to her sickness, and it was quite a shock, I'm sure, to her and also to myself. At the time, she was about 63 years old, and I found her uh, at home in bed and sick. That was really something that I had never been used to seeing. Okay, Brian. So she got very sick. You took her to the doctor at this point. What was the diagnosis and what did they do? Well, eventually I had to take her to the hospital. It wasn't very long after she got sick that she ended up in the hospital. And the diagnosis was that her thyroid gland was producing too much thyroid hormone. Apparently, this is a very serious problem. It could be life-threatening. It really caught us off guard. It came out of the blue. We certainly weren't expecting something like that to happen. Okay, so her thyroid was overactive. As in hyperthyroidism. Right, exactly. It was producing too much of the thyroid hormone. Instead of trying to reduce the amount of thyroid hormone or figure out why the thyroid was hyperactive, Instead, they decided to, to kill the thyroid. To attack the organ. In the name of health. Right. That is all that I know. I don't remember any discussion about anything other than using the radioactive iodine to basically destroy the thyroid completely. Okay, so... Uh, I'm sorry. Just This is the sort of thing that takes me aback. You know, sometimes it's like, in the name of health and restoring her health, they're going to poison her with radiation to destroy one of her most important organs. Yeah, I don't think most people realize just how important the thyroid organ is. You hear about it every once in a while, but you don't really know what it does. Well, the thyroid produces hormones that regulate almost every bodily system. It even regulates the heart. Absolutely. We've had people call us who were dumb enough to drink iodine, an excessive amount in some cases, and because their hormones are so out of whack, they start having chest pains and shortness of breath. On the verge of a major heart attack, in other words. Of course, the thyroid's at the throat, sometimes it swells up too. And on top of that, they have trouble just breathing mm -hmm. because the th soil and thyroid as well. And then you had those other people who take iodine over an extended period, again, orally, and then they burn their thyroid out completely and then they just have no energy. They can't get out of bed because the thyroid is blown and then the adrenal glands are blown too. We weren't designed to drink iodine as like punch. Yeah. You know, as some people seem to think, like the followers of Dr. Brownstein. Yes. The point here is that the thyroid is absolutely fundamental to the health. Yeah. To live a long, healthy life, she needed the thyroid. They condemned her. Right. They absolutely condemned her by poisoning it with radiation. One time what they used to do was give a person a fluoride, which was, you know, somewhat toxic to the thyroid. Somewhat? To, to the thyroid. You call it fluoride somewhat toxic, right? Well, specifically to okay, the thyroid. It, it wouldn't kill it. Yeah, it's, it's just relative, right? It's, it is all relative. Uh -huh. um, when you compare it to radioactive iodine, suddenly fluoride seems like the same A health option. elixir, right? It's like vitamin C at that point, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, I guess everything is so, relative. Well, the doctor, you know, he could have done that. He could have taken a, a less toxic, safer approach and then had the wait and see approach, see if he could fix it. Right. But instead of doing any of that, he went with nuking, destroy it. nuking the thyroid, which in effect, and completely coincidentally, means that Virginia Humphreys became a lifetime customer. Patient. She could never be free after that. Right, because after that, then she relies upon that synthetic thyroid replacement. Yeah, right. Didn't they tell you, in fact, that absolutely she would need to take the synthetic hormone for the rest of her life since they were going to destroy her thyroid? Oh, yes. But that was really not presented as if it was much of a big deal. It was just taking this little pill every day and apparently would solve the whole problem. We were looking at a situation where we really thought that her life was in danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You probably didn't have an internet account in those days to go research this. or No, that was before the internet. That was probably around 1988. Mm-hmm. All you had was the doctor's word. You, you trusted him. Back then, that's what people did. You didn't have, most people didn't have access to, or at least not easy access to, 
any more information. And I think that I had been taught to respect and trust doctors. I was told that doctors, preachers, and pharmacists were professionals. They're people who you can go to when you have a problem, and they deserve your trust. Pretty much the the mindset that went on at that time and before. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still like pretty unbelievable today. Yeah, it still happens today. We hear about it. All the time, we see it all around us. I mean, they're the high priests, the pillars of the community that you can't question, no matter how ridiculous it is. And when you think about it, Brian, when you really stop and think about it, especially in retrospect, somebody saying, hey, let's try poisoning you with radiation and maybe killing some of your organs for health. Let's try that. In retrospect, can't you just hear how ridiculous it sounds? Well, the nurse who gave her the pill at the last minute said, at least according to what I was told, do you really want to take this? I don't know why she said that, but my mother proceeded to take the pill. She was just trusting her doctor that it was necessary. Yeah, I'm not surprised. There are a lot of people in the profession who care and would do better if they were allowed to, simply allowed to by the regulations. But to me, it sounds like that nurse had an attack of conscience the last moment there. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you didn't have enough information to be able to know what she was warning you about or or what the alternatives would be. No, I don't think so. I thought it was very disturbing when I was told about that because it did make me think that maybe she should not have taken the pill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Brian, there are alternatives, but at the same time, there aren't. They exist. They existed before there was a synthetic, but they're not allowed to use them anymore. Roughly at the same time, and I can't remember which pharmaceutical company it was, Mm -hmm. came out with this synthetic hormone, Synthroid. At the same time, the FDA banned the natural hormones that you could buy. They were extracted from animals. Well, at least they banned it from being prescribed. Yeah, which pretty much takes it off the doctor's list. Yes. He'll lose his license, get fined, could even go to jail for practicing unapproved medicines. Yes. Which is the whole point of the licensing laws. It's not for our safety. It's to control the doctors to make sure they don't get out of line and start using alternatives that aren't as profitable. That's what like. Well, the truth was, my mother did have to make regular trips to an endocrinologist who did blood tests periodically to adjust the dosage of the synthetic thyroid hormone. Later on, much later on, many years later on, when we started to get more information from the internet and we learned about the natural thyroid hormone replacements. She had to change doctors in order to be able to try the natural kind because her endocrinologist said, well, at this office, we only use a synthetic and that's it. I was really pretty much shocked because I thought they would rather lose a patient than prescribe what she wanted. It seemed to be a perfectly good alternative to uh, the synthetic. Absolutely. In fact, the animal hormones were always known to be more stable. With the thyroid hormone... It simply worked better. It did. With the thyroid hormone, it's similar to the case with diabetics and their blood sugar. When you take the synthetic insulin, you'll often have these spikes where your blood sugar goes really high and then it goes really low, leaving the person... It's unnatural. Yeah, it's an unhealthy state to be in. And that's very similar. The exact same thing happens with With the the Synthroid. synthroid. What they don't tell you, and this is one of the dirty tricks of the establishment, like I say, there's a lot of innocent doctors who mean well. Just what they've got is what they've got to work with. Mm -hmm. They have to follow the system. In the case of the Synthroid, it ends up being a one-two punch. Her thyroid, at least part of her thyroid, might have survived the radiation treatments, but it would not survive long-term Synthroid use. And that's why I call it the one-two punch, because If you take the synthetic thyroid, the synthetic thyroid hormone, Mm -hmm. it will shut the thyroid down. It poisons it, just like the radiation does. So by prescribing that and only that, what they were actually doing is ensuring that her thyroid could not survive and that your mother would always be entirely dependent upon them. That's really part of the game plan. And it's evil. You're never free after that. And in the end, that came back to haunt Virginia in a big way. Well, at the time, we were led to believe that taking the pill wasn't a big deal, but she did have to go to her general practitioner 
to get a prescription for the natural kind, and he was a very uh, elderly doctor. Maybe that's the only reason that he was willing to prescribe it, but I know that when her medication list was passed around at other doctor's offices, that prescription raised eyebrows, and there were people in the offices questioning who prescribed this natural thyroid hormone because it gave me the feeling that it was not the preferred medication to use. Mm -hmm. And I even was concerned that maybe her general practitioner might be hearing about it from someone. Oh, yeah. The whole reason for the raised eyebrows, Brian, was because they were probably whispering amongst themselves, is he going to lose his license now? Yeah, that's sad. Yeah, it's bucking the system. It's the right thing to do. Yes. With the older doctors, you can sometimes get that. They care a little bit less about following the rules. And these people who were looking over her records, they weren't even doctors. They were just people who worked out in the front office. But apparently their job is to uh, look for anything that is irregular. I wouldn't be surprised if one of them didn't call the FDA to rat the guy out. Or the local, the state medical board or something. Yeah, me either. Brian, if I recall correctly, your mom's tailspin began after this, after the thyroid was destroyed. I remember that she did well for a short while, and then bang. Could you tell us what happened? Yes, she recovered to some degree. I would say she was never the same, though, after the thyroid issue. Her condition always was getting worse. She was coming down with arthritis and was diagnosed with rheumatoid osteoarthritis, also osteoporosis. So her um, bones and muscles were basically wasting away. She was getting a lot of pain in her joints. It was getting harder for her to get around. She had been quite active. A lot of this, especially the wasting away and the osteoporosis, was probably largely caused by the thyroid. That and the electrolytes that were probably thrown out of balance by it all. And one of the electrolytes is calcium, of course. Well, of course. And there's so many disease states that cause the body to not deal with calcium properly. So many. Yes. We had no idea that all of her problems could have been traced back to the thyroid because we still believe that as long as she took that little pill, her life would be normal. Okay, Brian. Well, from here, did it continue getting worse? Or what did you do about it? Well, at this point, she's been diagnosed with two kinds of arthritis and osteoporosis. Those are ailments that I think are a lot more serious than we're led to believe sometimes. I don't think that arthritis is something that really just equates with aging, kind of like your joints are getting a little bit rusty. Arthritis is really a lot worse than that. In her case, it was inflammation and pain in her joints. It was swelling actual heat that could be felt in one of her knees. Eventually, pretty much the destruction of the joints. She could have been a candidate for joint replacement, but fortunately we knew better than to try to fix the problem with basically cutting away the natural joint and replacing it with some artificial gadget that they put in. We tried rheumatologists. They prescribed all of the popular pills of the day, the Fosamax, and I don't really remember the names of the others, but at this point, you have to remember that both my mother and I still didn't really know any better than to trust doctors. Our idea was that if we weren't having much success, we just needed to find a better doctor. Maybe if we have one who's more specialized, maybe if we leave the area. Maybe if we spend more money, we might find a really good doctor who would know how to make her well. That really was our mindset for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very normal. Yeah, well, so many people agree with that, even today. That's part of the values of the past, but even today there's a lot of that. Finding a better doctor usually doesn't improve things because it doesn't matter how good the doctor is, he still has that list of approved medications for that condition. Right, his hands are still tied. Yeah. That was the problem with my mother. The medications just didn't agree with her. 
at the time, I really had not a very good attitude about it. At the time, I just thought, we're getting you to these doctors, you're getting the best medicines. Why don't you just take your pills and shut up? I don't want to hear about it. I was just very frustrated because at that point, I was trying to help her find cures for her ailments. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had been doing her own research. She had really a whole shelf full of books that she had accumulated about medicine. She spent a lot of time reading. Trying to get her well was a big project for her. I didn't really fully appreciate that at the time I was busy with my work. I couldn't understand why she couldn't just take the pills and get well. But she was always telling me that she thought that the pills were making her more sick. They feel like poison. They're toxic. After a while, I had to start thinking that maybe there's some truth to what she's saying. Okay, Brian, was there anything notable about any of the rheumatologists that you saw? You said you shopped around. I found that they really had two kinds of pills, the fancy high-tech arthritis pills. I don't really understand how they were supposed to work. And really, the other thing that they would do is offer to prescribe stronger painkillers, stronger than what you could get over the counter. Obviously, a lot of what they were doing was really just trying to kill the pain. By this time, the internet had arrived. I was starting to try to help my mother with her research. I think that she was running into dead ends with it. It wasn't helping her enough. Between the two of us, we read some information about a Dr. McPherson Brown program that was a different method of treating arthritis because it was treating it as a pathogenic illness, not as just some kind of mysterious thing that is the result of aging or general uh, degradation of the body. The Dr. Brown program was to attack a specific germ, and they called it a mycoplasma. From what I remember, that was something that was neither a bacteria nor a virus, but maybe something in between, certainly something mysterious in our minds. It was something that could actually be targeted and attacked, and that to us, that seemed a lot more positive than anything that we had heard before. We were able to find a doctor who was supposed to know how to prescribe that program and was willing to do it. He was out of state, but not terribly far away. He seemed to be a very good doctor who did the best he could with what he was taught. His credentials were excellent, and my mother decided that it was worth a try. Okay, Brian, well, did you have any success with any of it? Did any of it work? Well, I think that it worked for a very short time, to a very limited extent, maybe about three months after she started taking the Dr. Brown program. The doctor just immediately sat down and wrote out about a dozen prescriptions. We had two kinds of tetracycline and a number of other things that I don't remember anymore. I know she was also told to take very large dose of aspirin. And and these were for long-term use. These were to be taken month after month. The trouble is the effect only seemed to help for a short time. Within several months of starting the Dr. Brown program, my mother came down with appendicitis. She had to be rushed to the hospital and her appendix had to come out. That was very, very close to um, ending her life right there at that point. I think we were lucky that we had a very good surgeon who could take care of that situation, and they were successful in saving her life. I don't know whether that had anything to do with the overload of aspirin that she was taking or any of the other medications, but that was the end of that program there. We certainly didn't continue it on after the appendicitis. Once again, after the appendicitis, she was never the same again. This is interesting because most doctors who hear about the diagnosis of the type of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, just give arthritis drugs or painkillers. Like you said, this one was willing to try an antibiotic regimen. Now, what's interesting about that is with rheumatoid arthritis, you have arthritis that's moving around from joint to joint as if it has a will of its own. 
Now, we're told that arthritis happens because you damage a joint and then, you know, it never heals correctly. And, mm-hmm. and that's where the pain comes from. Now, that doesn't make sense if it's moving from joint to joint. But it doesn't. It's like, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Let's, let's compare it with another type of injury just to make it a good example here. What if you cut your hand really badly one day? Then you woke up the next morning and your foot was cut too, or the cut had supposedly moved to your foot. Your common sense has got to tell you there's something not right here. If the diagnosis is the cut moved, it moves around on its own, then it just doesn't make sense. That last doctor you found, the one who said that arthritis is pathogenic, well, he was right. Our own research shows the same thing, that it can be killed. If arthritis were inflammation from an injury, you couldn't cure it. Yeah. And, and it certainly wouldn't move around with a will of its own wherever it decided to go next week or next month or next year. It wouldn't populate all the joints of your hand or all the ones of your foot or your knee or your hip or wherever. I know you can't comment on this, Brian, as we mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. but we've had people who can cure their arthritis with with silver, Mm -hmm. their arthritis that moves around. Yeah. So it is definitely pathogenic in some of these cases. Yeah. Well, in her case, it, it absolutely did move around. That was one of the characteristics of it. It seemed to attack all of her major joints. One day I would hear about her aching shoulders. The next day I would hear about her elbows, her wrists, her knees. And then sometimes it wouldn't be so bad in a certain area. So absolutely, this was definitely moving around. Yeah, like Sarah was saying, in some cases, you can cure it with colloidal silver. I've actually heard of people using borax, but that's insane. Anybody who's listening, do not use borax. That's a fraud. You're going to hurt yourself more than help yourself. The risk is the risk to benefit ratio is is, is really low. Yeah, probably going to lose the battle, perhaps by dying. Right, symptoms may go away for a while because the body is too busy trying to deal with the fact that you're poisoning yourself with borax. In that sense, it's like an immunosuppressant. Right, but it won't last forever. Your body will just start failing. Yeah, your body doesn't show the symptoms because of the it's concentrating elsewhere too much. It's sort of like if you hurt your hand. You can make yourself forget about that pain by hitting yourself in the foot with a hammer. It really is the same logic. Same principle. Yeah. Yeah. The immune system just switches focus. Now, the antibiotic regimen in Virginia's case worked for about three months. About three months. This is just showing what happens. If you use antibiotics for long enough and they're not successful at killing the pathogen, what you end up with is a pathogen that's completely resistant to the antibiotics. And therefore, they don't do anything anymore. And that's probably why she took a turn for the worse after about three months. She wasn't getting enough to kill it, or it just wasn't effective at killing it. In any case, it bounced back with a vengeance because it became totally resistant. Right. And her immune system was impaired by the very fact that antibiotics are toxic. Were being pumped into her. She had heavy doses of antibiotics for an extended period. So her immune system took a hit from that as well. You're Mm -hmm. sure you're right about that, Sarah. Uh, And now at this point, she has two organs removed. So her mm-hmm. immune system will forever be. She's got two organs removed. She's full of poison, and her immune system is crippled. Yeah. Obviously, this does not bode well for Virginia, for a happy ending here. Yeah. Some people may not understand just how bad something like this is for the patient. When you uh, can no longer do the things that you're used to doing your whole life, things that you like to do, And then every time you move, you're in pain. If you're even able to move, it's something that just gets progressively worse. I saw her go through the stage where we thought that maybe she'd get a little bit of relief if she had a lift recliner chair, the kind that helps someone stand up once they get to the point where they can't even get up out of a chair. But really, by the time we got that for her, it would get her standing up, but then she couldn't walk away from it. So it was practically useless. It turns the patient into an absolute cripple. We feel for you, Brian and Miss Virginia, what she went through. I think in this day and age, it's an all too familiar story. Oh, yeah. All right, Brian, if I remember correctly, after the appendectomy, she went for a few years where she was more or less okay. And that was up until the ulcer on her leg. Is that right? For the next couple of years, her condition was somewhat stable. 
eventually she developed some ulcers on her lower extremities, mostly her toes and around her ankle. These were sores that just mysteriously popped out from nowhere. They became weeping wounds that were growing in size and could not be healed. We eventually had to take her to the wound care facilities that all the hospitals seem to be getting now. Really, she was not alone. There are a lot of older women who have what they call venous stasis ulcers, where the blood is circulating down to the lower extremities, but the veins are not carrying it up as fast as it's going down, so you get a sore that erupts and is losing liquid all the time. Apparently, it's a very serious condition. We had the test done. We took her to a number of doctors that uh, we were referred to at the first wound care facility. They were not able to make the sores go away. We ended up taking her to three hospitals, three different wound care facilities. In one instance, they were able to get the sores healed for a short time. After a week of hospitalization, about a month in a specialty hospital, and then a few more months in a nursing home, uh, one time they were able to get the ulcers almost completely healed, but it only lasted about five months. When she came home, five months later, it came back with a vengeance. So there we had to start all over again. The next time around, things were different with the way the doctors looked at it. Once it was obvious that the sore wasn't going to heal, they told her to go home from the hospital, think about it a little bit, and then come back and they will amputate. The doctor reasoned that she can't walk anyway. What does she need her leg for? She'd be better off without it. At that point, the family pretty much drew the line. My brother and I were not going to stand by and let them cut off her leg. I went to work putting together an oxygen generator that could be used to get oxygen underneath bandaging. When you have bandaging that's wet all the time, it's hard to get air to it. You have a definite infection waiting to happen. When you have something that's wet all the time, you have bandaging that is being changed constantly, but is constantly getting soiled again. Uh, putting the oxygen under it is something that I learned might be helpful, and we did that. We had uh, a small tube with oxygen, pumping oxygen under the bandage, she was able to have that on almost 24 hours a day. We were trying all kinds of things. We tried the Manuka honey, the honey patches, and eventually we came up with an herbal extract that we got through the mail. It had cayenne pepper in it. It had some strong vegetables, about a half a dozen different ingredients. It had a very disagreeable taste, but you were only told to take what amounted to less than a quarter of a teaspoon. So. If you could stomach the foul-tasting medicine, you know, it might help get your blood flowing. It turned out that it was really that simple. With the oxygen and the herbal remedy, the sore started to actually shrink away. This was after we considered sending her out of state to doctors who did all kinds of things like burn away the veins that were bad by inserting things into her leg to destroy some of the veins. Somehow that was supposed to help her circulation. On two occasions at the wound care hospitals, they also had put probes in her arteries and came to the conclusion that there was nothing wrong with her arteries. That was done twice. When it was done the second time, I wasn't very happy with the doctor who did it because he basically was telling me that we pretty much just wasted another surgical procedure on her and we came up with nothing. So what you're saying here is that they spent an enormous amount of money, several wound care facilities, suggested amputations, suggested burning her veins, and you were able to heal these wounds by yourself, you and your mother, with some extra oxygen to the wound. And nutrition. And nutrition. Unbelievably, that's really what the facts are. After a week in the hospital these days will cost you six figures. So that might give you some idea what Medicare and the insurance must have been paying for all this. While the herbal extract remedy was something that was kind of expensive to buy, there wasn't any comparison. We were talking about maybe 
$50 bottles of herbal formula. Even the oxygen, fortunately, that was something that I could build because I had done prototyping work. Making an oxygen generator was not something that was very hard for me to do. I think the herbs probably helped more than the oxygen. I don't really know. The oxygen had to help at some. It certainly didn't hurt anything. Mm -hmm. I had read accounts where oxygen like that, even a lesser amount than I was using, had healed sores like that. Well, Brian, what you've told us so far is terrible, but it hadn't even gotten bad yet, had it? It was going to get a lot worse in the fall of 2014. My best guess is that that's when my mother suffered a stroke and she developed a swallowing disorder. I couldn't put my finger on exactly when and how it happened, but I know that it landed her in the hospital. She just wasn't eating very much anymore. I was concerned about it, and because she wasn't eating, I knew I had to do something. So I took her to the hospital again. That's really where a lot of the nightmares began. It was necessary to give her a feeding tube. I had never uh, dealt with a swallowing disorder before. It was something totally new to me. Caused by the stroke? I don't even know. All that I know is there were the symptoms of a stroke. Okay. I think any of the doctors could only, they couldn't tell you any more than I could that it appeared that she had a stroke. It was shortly after that she was having trouble eating, so I thought there probably was some relationship between the stroke and the swallowing disorder. Okay, so she was in the hospital and she needed a feeding tube. No brainer, she can't swallow. Mm -hmm. The big concern there was that we didn't have a doctor who really came in and broke the news to us or anything. We just were left on our own to try to figure that out for ourselves. We actually had to argue with the doctors to get them to give her a feeding tube. Even though without it, she couldn't eat? Wait a minute, she was starving to death, and they didn't want to intervene. Well, I think that she had to be malnourished before she came to the hospital because that's the reason we took her there. She had already been not eating enough for, I don't know, at least several days before we took her to the hospital. We had to argue about the tube. They had her on intravenous feeding, and they seemed to think that that was quite good for a long period of time. Maybe another week or 10 days could go by with just intravenous feeding for someone who was already having a problem before she came to the hospital. So I had to argue to get them to put a feeding tube in. We went with the kind that goes through the nose because that was actually the easiest to put in place. After about a week, we finally got them to put a nose tube in. And I was very happy that she was finally getting some actual food, even though it was just canned formula. At least she was getting something. Hmm. Okay. All right. Formula's pretty rough stuff. I know, but I can can only imagine being there with a close loved one who hasn't been eating for a few days before you bring him to the hospital. Then can't eat whilst in the hospital, and the doctors don't seem concerned about it. That really was very shocking to me. First of all, that no one actually sat us down and gave us any kind of uh, decent overview of what our mother's condition was, what the prognosis would be, any recommendations. We were really limited to getting information in bits and pieces as people walked in and out of the room on their daily routine. I had never been treated that way in my life. We did eventually... After arguing, we got the feeding tube put in, but my mother pulled it out before it was in for a whole day, I think. By the next day when I came in, the tube was gone, and I had to go ask around to try to find out what happened to it. Then I found out that she had pulled it out. I guess that probably is not an unusual thing. I think if someone shoved a tube down my nose and I didn't know what it was for, I might tend to pull it out, too. The next decision that had to be made then was to um, put in a uh, stomach tube. The surgeon who did her appendix told me that even though he didn't work at that hospital anymore, he thought that the stomach tube had to be put in. That was really the only way to 
to assure that she would be fed. I had to go back again with the doctors and try to argue with them to get them to put a stomach tube in. They finally agreed to put the stomach tube in, but it took about a week for them to get it scheduled to send her down to surgery to put the stomach tube in. This is a life-saving function, but it had to wait until it was convenient for their schedule. I never heard of a hospital operating that way. Yeah. After all of that, somebody might say to himself, they're trying to kill her, and then, of course, after that, say, no, no, I'm just being paranoid. But one thing that I want listeners to pay attention to here is the pattern that develops. This is the beginning of a pattern, a pattern that shows the medical staff at both the hospitals involved and the nursing homes involved, as the story unfolds, will be showing a pattern that they're conspiring together to euthanize Virginia, that she's too old and too sick, and that it's just not right to let her live, which is the reason why they weren't talking to Brian and his family members. Because once that decision is made that they're going to quote, let her die, unquote, or actually directly involve themselves in the act of killing her, then discussing it with any of her relatives only involves risk for them. There's no benefit. People are going to see that pattern as this story goes on. Absolutely. That is a very tough pill to swallow, even for me. And I was always kind of a contrarian at heart. But As I said, I really started out giving the doctors every benefit of the doubt. I tried to work with them, but that was long ago and far away at this point. I think at this point, things were starting to come into focus. Instead of actually talking to us about her condition at all, we weren't even really given access to doctors. I would have to try to catch them when they come in her room. What we did get access to were what they call social workers in the hospital. That certainly is kind of a misnomer because when you say social worker, it makes me think of someone who is trying to help and maybe some kind of government office that has that title, but that's not what these people really are in the hospital. I think that what it really amounts to is that they're salespeople. And the first thing that they wanted from the family was what they call a DNR, or a do not resuscitate order. That was given to me to sign. We did eventually cancel that DNR order. By canceling the order, we allowed them to do a final attempt to save her life when it was really too late. I still have a hard time when I think about what was really happening there at the hospital My brother, his wife, and myself were subjected to having to meet with people who, uh, what it turned out to be, I think their job was to sell a hospice program that, let's just say it was a branded program. It was a program that was run by some corporation that they worked for and uh, subscribed to somehow by the hospital. I, I don't really know all the details. The social workers, I always saw them as kind of like salespeople in the hospital. Just the feeling that I had about them, to me, they're not really professionals, not the kind of professionals that I was taught to look up to as a child. And what are they trying to do? They did the best they could to convince my family that we should sign a do not resuscitate order. They were really pushing very hard for some kind of hospice program. I really, at this point, was cutting them off at every turn. I really didn't give them the time of day because I didn't really think they were qualified to be intervening in our family affairs. I was questioning what their purpose really was. I wasn't cooperating, and it's certainly not the first time that medical people have acted as if they will not take no for an answer. When they tell you that your parent really belongs in a nursing home, Your parent really belongs in hospice. A lot of these things are things where family members have to make decisions, but they're made to feel as if there really is no decision to make and that they can't say no. I think the hospital staff must have been making note of the time when I usually came in each day and they had their top social worker, an elderly gentleman who was some kind of a professor of ethics. 
and he worked for the hospital, and he was waiting for me right outside the door to my mother's room. And his big question was, do you really think she's going to live? Really, maybe that would have been a better question for one of the doctors who never spoke to us about anything. I really don't know what this man was trying to get me to do, but I really couldn't give him much satisfaction. I was surprised just the way the whole thing was handled. It was as if we were supposed to just sort of know how we're supposed to act, what decisions we're supposed to make. The hospital didn't really know what to do with anyone who would question anything or wouldn't just immediately go along with the drift, whatever that was, even though it was kind of ill-defined. Please check us out and read our reports at the HealthWise Report website. You can find us on the internet at healthwise.org. Take special note that WISE is spelt W-Y-Z-E. We spell it W-Y-Z-E to emphasize wisdom. We are a not-for-profit organization, although we are not registered with any governmental agency. Nevertheless, we are a not-for-profit organization, so we always need donors to help us to continue our work, whether it be the equipment for these radio shows, our website and network infrastructure, various fees for our movie productions, and of course, the occasional video game to help us maintain our sanity through it all. You can also support us by visiting our online store. That can also be found at healthwise.org. And again, WISE is spelt W-Y-Z-E. We have to be careful about what claims we make about our products, including claims that can be verified, because we know of at least one governmental agency that would love to shut us down. We can tell you that our colloidal copper lotion has qualities that cannot be found in any other lotion sold. So if you have joint or skin problems of any kind, we recommend that you check out our lotion. You can also find our book, Defy Your Doctor and Be Healed, which contains our best work, condensed and re-edited into a nearly 600-page encyclopedia. It is the do-it-yourself guide to health, and it makes a fantastic gift. We also sell the HealthWise Antiperspirant, which is truly aluminum and petroleum free. We would not use anything else ourselves because the competing products are atrocious, including the supposedly natural products. Thanks for listening to this. We'll get back to the show now. Brian, from listening to you, one could easily get the impression that they just wanted your mom to die at the hospital, that they're trying to get you to sign paperwork to, as they would say, let her go or be an active part in her death by making that decision for her. That's definitely the way that I felt. It didn't take me long to get that impression at the hospital. It didn't take them long to have social workers present us with a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. And I had the feeling that it was just another one of the kinds of things where they didn't like want to take no for an answer. Brian, for our listeners who don't know, what exactly is a DNR? What does it mean? A do not resuscitate order means that there are limits on what will be done when the patient is sick and life-saving treatments can be withheld. You and the rest of your family, you never requested the DNR? No, we did not. What about your mother, who was the patient, or slash victim, however you want to put it? Did she at any point say, I've lived a full life, I'm just ready to go, I don't want to hurt anymore, just just let me die? No, if she had wanted a DNR, she could have prepared one long before she went in the hospital, but nothing like that was done. At the hospital, they had all the papers ready for us to sign. We didn't have to do a thing other than start signing. I mean, it's just hard to grasp that... You're in a hospital, a place where they're supposed to heal. You've taken her to this place of healers. Where you expect them to save lives. Right, exactly. And instead of doing that, they're going up to the family requesting essentially permission to kill her. Yeah. like To not heal. I guess with the excuse of she's not in any condition to speak for herself right now. So let's go to the family and see if we can talk them into letting us kill her. Right. Well, my mother's wishes were well known by the family and there was no do not resuscitate order ever prepared by her. Mm -hmm. Sadly enough, this isn't shocking anymore. 
they're approaching the family with the attitude and agenda of, let's euthanize her. She's too old anyway. Let's just get rid of her. At the hospital, they may have had that attitude, but that was certainly not anything that the family would have even thought of. Oh, I'm sure. We're not accusing you, but it is something that we hear about. The hospitals and their tie-ins with hospice. It's one big Once happy. Once we saw what they actually did at the hospital, then as much as I would hate to have to believe it, it really did look as if they were withholding things that should have been done for her. Right. So she was 30 years younger. They maybe, maybe, maybe with some Blue Cross insurance. With the right insurance plan, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, then they need to save her life. Right, and maybe then they would have put the feeding tube in right away. It's, we're going to intentionally do nothing while she's here at the hospital to, quote, let her die, unquote, what they call palliative care. I think that that was their idea because they thought that she could get by on intravenous nutrition alone for much longer than I think it made sense. I think she was deprived of real food, even the kind that would be put in through a feeding tube. She wasn't even getting that. Considering that she had not been eating before she went in the hospital, and that's why we took her there, I think that malnutrition certainly was setting in, and the feeding tube was our only hope to do anything about it at that point. When you're dealing with hospices that do euthanasia, and let's just say an alarming number of them do, I'm mm -hmm. practically all. I'm just going to call it like it is. Their number one way of getting rid of old people is through malnutrition, through starvation. They'll drug them to where they don't know where they're at, they don't feel anything, and while they're in this drug-induced coma, they're starved to death. So now in retrospect, looking back on what happened with your mom, do you really believe that they had good intentions with their IVs when you consider that they had spokesmen following you around the hospital telling you to let her die? It just certainly would defy any common sense to think that way. I'm not an expert on intravenous nutrition. I don't know how long one can survive on that or how long it would be prudent to keep a patient on that. But I do think that it certainly seemed to be too long, and it didn't make any sense to rely on intravenous-only feeding when the simple feeding tube could have been put in and she could have at least gotten canned formula, which has to be a lot better than the intravenous. It was probably all about plausible deniability. You see, if they're doing something for her, anything at all, then they can say, well, we were doing what we could, even though they might know that she's still going to die. Right, and I also wanted to say that regardless of how long a healthy person can survive on just a, an IV drip, that doesn't mean that somebody who is in that bad a condition is going to get better. Yeah, she was already in bad shape. She needed every bit of nutrition She at needed that all she could get, you're right. That was the feeling that I had. I think that she was sorely in need of nutrition. And once we did get a feeding tube in, I was really happy to see it start. And I wanted the feeding to continue. All right, Brian, so she's been in the hospital and you've been harassed almost endlessly by these people who want to essentially put your mother down. The vultures. The, the vultures, yeah. So uh, what happens now? What happens next? I think it was the worst, most horrific hospital experience that I had ever seen. I was happy to see her leave, even though she was being transferred to a nursing home. Once she was there, her condition didn't get any better. My brother and I spoke to her nursing home doctor about changing the feeding formula that she was getting. We just wanted to add some orange juice for extra vitamin C. The doctor absolutely refused to change the formula, even though there were other canned formulas, even ones that were FDA approved that could have been used for variety. But for some reason, he wanted to stick with this one formula he agreed to a limited trial of orange juice. If for some reason, they had it set that she was getting that sometime very later in the middle of the night. But they did give her orange juice for a short time as a trial. We're going to get back to the vitamin C thing because it just, we want to make sure people don't miss this thing that ought to slap them in the face. 
But I want to say if they were sticking her on a formula. It was kind of like baby formula in a sense, but this stuff was essentially a soy formula with vitamins added. Now, for those who don't know, the last thing you want to do to someone who has hormone problems, like, for instance, somebody with a malfunctioning thyroid, for instance, is soy. That is the last thing you want to give a person because soy contains phytoestrogens, which wreak havoc with the hormones, take them out of balance even more. It was almost like they were poisoning her all over again, Brian. And yet they were unwilling to let him try something that had a little bit more nutrition. I mean, it's hard, you know, when you're dealing with a formula to actually have something that has some value to it. Yeah. But Brian and his family, we were in touch with them at this point, were trying to switch to something that was a little bit healthier. You know, there wasn't a full soy base. Just trying formula. to help a little bit. Is that- and my gosh, are we to believe that the doctors don't know about vitamin C? That they actually truly believe that vitamin C is dangerous? That radioactive iodine to destroy the thyroid, that's fine. Vitamin C, you better watch out. Right, and it wasn't even pure vitamin C. We're just talking orange juice. Uh-huh. But I believe it was the vitamin C that made it so dangerous. Right. It's just incredible. plain, ordinary orange juice. That's all we were asking for. To me, it's like, if you need the agenda clarified anymore, they're trying to block her from getting orange juice and vitamin C. I think that at this point, I knew that there was an agenda, and it certainly didn't change any once she went into the nursing home. If anything, at that point, it gets even worse. Yeah, I imagine... She didn't do any better in the nursing home. She continued deteriorating, is that right? Well, I would say that she was in pretty much a comatose state during most of the time that she was in the nursing home. I felt lucky if I walked in to the room and she was able to recognize me. That's how bad it was. Were they drugging her like that? Or was they had gotten her in such bad shape at that point, she just was unconscious? It's hard to say, but I kind of think it was just the bad shape that she was in. We tried to watch over the medications that she was getting, but we really had no way of knowing for sure whether uh, she was getting or might have been getting something that we didn't know about. I don't know. She really was worse than ever after several days in the home. They brought in an oxygen generator. I wasn't given any information about that, but I thought that that can't be a good sign. In some cases, this is one of the dirty tricks that's played at some hospices and even some hospitals when they're going to palliatively let someone die. Some of our listeners are just going to find this hard to believe. And it is hard to believe because we don't really want to think our fellow man can be quite that evil and that our people in the priestly white robes can be that bad, but they are sometimes. In some cases, they'll drug someone, a patient, to the point where the patient can't sit up or move around much. In some cases, they're like your mother. She was just in such bad shape she couldn't move around or sit up much. They get them in that condition, and then they supposedly pretend to help the patient with oxygen. But what they do is they pump in oxygen with too much moisture. And when you leave a patient laying down flat on their back all the time like that, pumping the lungs full of moisture, what you're doing is intentionally bringing on pneumonia which is probably one of the most dangerous things that could have happened to your mother. Right. And in a lot of these cases, they'll do that at the same time as refusing the person any real water. They won't actually give them water because, well, supposedly they're protecting them from pneumonia. But they're actually protecting them from pneumonia. They're actually putting moisture directly into the lungs. Yeah, and then when the pneumonia strikes, they're like, well, we were doing everything we could. Look, we weren't even giving her water. Yeah, it's outrageous. The scary thing, really, that I found was that really when you put a parent in a nursing home, the nursing home doctor, for all practical purposes, is in command of the parent's care, and the family doesn't have anything to say about it. We couldn't go against doctor's orders. All that we could do was try to plead with the doctor to do maybe something that we wanted him to do, such as the orange juice, but basically I was warned that I was not allowed to give her anything when she was in the nursing home. If I remember correctly, this is where the war really started. Before it was all over, there was police involvement, you'd been to court, uh, and you even had to present a medical power of attorney just to get her out of there. Can you tell us about it? Well, unbelievably, that really all is true, and I wanted to take her home from the nursing home. 
I could see that it was just an uphill battle to try to argue with the doctor about her care. To make a long story short, I was not allowed to take her home. The police were brought in, and I was escorted away. The next step there was that the doctor was going to court and trying to get custody of my mother, or at least the custody of the state, to take over. I had to go to court and work with the county aging authorities to um, arrange to have my mother released from the home. As it turned out, the doctor didn't show up for the court, and the county authorities were cooperative. I think that they may have not been entirely pleased with the way the doctor was handling the situation. I walked out with a court order to have my mother sent home in short order from the nursing home, and the county made sure that it was complied with. She was sent home in an ambulance within a day or two. Okay, so you went up there to try and get your own mother out of the nursing home, and they refused you and called the police? The police were lining the corridors. It was New Year's Day. I didn't warn them that I was coming. I just came and told them that I want to take her home. I didn't pressure them to hurry up or anything. I was more than patient and more than polite and civil throughout the whole thing. I was kept waiting for a very long period of time. Instead of preparing to release her from the home, they were really just organizing and bringing all their people in. It was a holiday, but they rounded up the owner of the home. Apparently, they had time to call the police and everything, so that when I was finished meeting with them, I walk out into the hallway, and it's pretty much lined with police officers at least three or four in the one corridor. I'm going to reiterate what I just heard, and you tell me if I'm right. They sent you in to talk to you while stalling you. They set up a trap by calling the police in, and they did it all because you, as her closest relative, wanted to take her home, and they decided she is their property, a ward of them and the state. Yes, exactly. That is what it amounted to. The doctor was trying to move for formalizing that ward of the state status. I mean, it just seems so outrageous. It's like, it's like she's how, their property how suddenly? How would the, the doctor own your mother? Yeah, how did they take oh, it Well, they, they had all kinds of excuses. They thought that it wasn't safe for me to put her in the car and take her home, that it really had to be done by ambulance, which eventually it was. No matter what I said to them, they always had more arguments. Starving her to death, fine. Driving her home, that's dangerous. Right. At this point, it's pretty clear that they don't have any interest in her health. No. But it's like they're actively conspiring to kill her. And make damn sure Brian doesn't get in the way. Right, exactly. It takes it to an even further level. It's... He's trying to get her out of their way. You'd think they'd be like, yeah, get rid of her, you know? It's like, it's it's like escape from hospice. They could make a movie about it. Yeah. I had no doubt that when I was talking to them that no matter what I said, there was going to be no letting her leave that day. Their minds had already been made up. They were just going through the motions of having a meeting. It was already predetermined. Anything that I said, they always countered with an argument. Why I can't take her home. They get away with this because they wear the white coats. I mean, if anybody else were to do this, like if your mom visited me and was sleeping and we couldn't wake her up, she's on the couch, you came to try to get her, and we said, no, it's not safe. When the police showed up, it would be us who were arrested for kidnapping. I think that that really is the way the law is supposed to work around here. But if we have the Ph.D. and the white coat, then suddenly we're not kidnappers. We're heroes. I guess you were lucky, Brian, that you had the uh, medical power of attorney. I think so. That was one thing that my mother did have prepared in advance. So if she wanted a DNR, she certainly could have had that go with it. The medical power of attorney is something that she wanted me to have. And just for any listeners who don't know, the medical power of attorney gives somebody else the ability to make healthcare decisions for you if you're unable to make them yourself. Yeah. 
In another situation, the doctor might instead take command if you don't have the medical power of attorney. He might make those decisions instead. Well, I would think that that is something that you would really never want to have happen. Uh, the doctor take command? I imagine not. Yeah. <laughs> it's something to think about, and even the medical power of attorney should be very carefully written because sometimes the patient can partially communicate and their communications need to be interpreted. And if they're being interpreted by the doctor, depending on how the medical power of attorney is written, it could be overridden. So it's something that needs to be given a lot of thought before you sign one. Okay, so you don't want the sick person to be semi-delirious and say something that's misinterpreted by the doctor as, kill me now. Exactly. It yeah. wouldn't have to be that dramatic, but I saw the doctors always trying to question my mother and interpret, and I thought that was kind of a dangerous situation. I think that if you have that kind of a document drawn up, it should be a family member who does the interpreting, someone who knows the patient and knows how they speak and how they make gestures and can accurately interpret them. Okay, Let but a stranger do it, then you don't know what could happen. What we're talking about here is normal. This is what happens at the end of life for most people and their families. This is normal. In some cases, the family doesn't fight. They're like, we have to listen to the experts. We have to listen to the doctors. They just sign whatever they're told to sign, and they shut up and they sit down. Whether the relatives are fighting to save their loved ones or whether they're the sit down and shut up types, death is usually the outcome. Euthanasia is usually the outcome. This is not rare. This is normal. Other people share these same stories. Most people are just too afraid to even ask about this sort of thing for fear of looking crazy themselves. I remember, I think from Brian, way back, that... They played so dirty. They played such hardball over trying to take control and own his mother and then so they could kill her that when Brian was a problem for them, they decided to go to Brian's brother to try to play the relatives against each other. Didn't that happen, Brian? My brother did get telephone calls and he was asked questions. He did talk to the doctor. I don't know whether it was on the telephone or at the home. Certainly, if there would have been any disunity in the family, I'm sure that that would have been used against me and my mother. Right, it would have been taken advantage of. Fortunately, my brother was in agreement with me for the most part on this. I think that he could see that something was very wrong about the way that our mother was being treated. From a lot of the cases we've heard, People realize that there's something wrong, but they struggle so much to, to accept what's really going on that they don't really realize it until after their, their loved one has passed. They have that, oh my gosh moment, what happened? They get this uncomfortable feeling the whole time whilst their loved one is in, say, hospice, but they don't know what to say because you've got all these different doctors and nurses and, and experts around them saying, this is what we need to do. Yes, we know that her hands are turning blue, but that doesn't mean anything and then, the other way. And it's really hard for them to come forward because there's the whole believability that they find it hard to believe. They know everybody else would find it all hard to believe. But if they truly accept it and come forward with it, then that also means accepting their own responsibility and killing that loved one. Right. And so it's a huge goal for people to try to jump. It really is. I imagine you see the same thing worldwide. You'd have to. Oh, absolutely. In fact... When I was growing up you know, in the UK, I often heard people who were avoiding the hospitals because they were old. They were too afraid because you they know, were old. There was, a, there was a guy who lived up the street from us, and he had this limp. And he had the limp for, for 10 years, but his wife was kind of on to him about getting rid of the limp. But he refused to go to the hospital because he was too old. He said, I'm 60. I'm not going into the hospital. And if I go to the hospital, even if they try to save me, they're going to experiment on me. That's what they do with the elderly. He, he called it a death trap, and he was probably right. England, where Sarah's from, is especially known for that. In their socialized healthcare system over there, the elderly are the guinea pigs, because they're expendable. Yeah. Before we go on with this, there was one thing about the nursing home that really just bothered me. The way they sent my mother home, they did send her in an ambulance. They had lots of pillows and blankets. 
old junky ones that had patches on them. And she was in this old-looking hospital gown that looked like it had been washed a hundred times. When I went to get her, I had taken some of her nicer clothes along so that she could get dressed up to be sent home. And I found that they had just thrown her clothes away. Right, so you wanted to send her home with, with some dignity, and they decided to punish you by throwing those clothes away. That's exactly what happened. To punish you? For trying to save her. To humiliate them? Mm-hmm. They did not have to do what they did. Well, Brian, we could certainly understand why that would bother you. It would bother us. Yeah, it's, it's appalling treatment. You know, it would bother me to the point to where I would feel like dragging the doctor or whoever behind the hospital for a real close-to-close personal conversation about it. I didn't get any help either from anyone to get her situated when she was at home. We had the rented hospital bed, oxygen generator, feeding pump, and everything. Visiting nurses were scheduled to come in, but it was all really up to me to get her moved up the steps and taken care of. Apparently, the ambulance crew wasn't equipped to move her up steps. Right, so essentially, they just didn't care. I mean, right, they just did the minimum yeah, that, they had to do. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. They didn't care. Well, I had no choice. I just had to work with what I had. Christmas of 2014, we received a letter. A letter from a man we'd never met before named Brian Humphreys. And he had filled out our questionnaire seeking assistance and advice and research for his sick mother. And sometimes when you read these, you just know that this is important. From what we got in the email, it seemed pretty clear to us that there was an underlying cause that was almost certainly Lyme disease. It went beyond both the thyroid and the supposed arthritis. Right. And again, as we discussed earlier, when you've got arthritis that jumps around from joint to joint... It's that, a pathogen. That's a pathogen. And we have found that Lyme disease is the pathogen in... Well, a lot of these cases. Yeah. Children who are diagnosed with arthritis most often have Lyme disease. Yes. And you can get Lyme disease from the obvious way of ticks, but you can also get it from drinking raw milk. That's something, yeah. just as a side note. A lot of our audience is catching Lyme disease from drinking raw milk, unfortunately. This should be mentioned yes. for their sake. All right. And so we, were, we started working with Brian on some herbal remedies and nutrition. Getting the nutrition into Virginia so that she could actually start healing. When we read over Brian's case, the case history, and talked to him about it, the first thing that came to mind was they've been starving her to death for years. We didn't even know what state she was really in. Because it's like, well, if someone's been starved for two years, of course they're going to be almost comatose. I yeah. mean, everybody would be. You'd have no energy. So without nutrition, we didn't know what her real status would be. Yeah, we needed to get nutrition into her, both through food itself and through herbal medicine, to at least get her conscious enough so we could appraise how she felt, what hurt. Exactly. So Brian started to mix up a variety of different foods in a blender. And juicing. Juicing, exactly. He could create some combinations with beef and vegetables yeah, it could and so just, forth. It could just taste awful and she wouldn't even know about it. Yeah, but it would be perfectly healthy. Perfectly healthy, yeah. So that's what he did, and after a few days, she actually improved dramatically. Isn't that right, Brian? She did. I had to take a crash course in making food that can be put through a tube. And there really are lots of recipes available. You and Thomas had a lot of very good ideas. And I thought this was actually a terrific opportunity because we can give her the best diet in the world. And we don't have to worry about what it tastes like. Yeah, what we yeah, have but, to worry about is can we puree it and get it through the tube without any problem. It was almost like a blessing she couldn't taste it because there were so many freaky combinations, but they were so good for her, too. Yeah, most people wouldn't want to drink well, that, a juice that has a meat in it. That may be so, but then we also could use herbal supplements. I think that those were very important because, as you said, those were ways that we could attack any pathogens that might have been there. Mm-hmm. I just thought I'd mention that he followed our Lyme protocol. We assume that helped too. It wasn't just the nutrition, it was also the herbs we gave him that were meant to attack the pathogen. One of those things was colloidal silver. Again, Brian probably can't comment on that. He probably can't. But he did treat his mother with colloidal silver, even though he can't recommend it to anyone else legally. Mm -hmm. Right. 
The regiment seemed to work pretty well for a while, and if I remember correctly, the silver was especially good for her throat, which kept having issues with mucus. Right, it, helped, it kept clearing her airways and yeah, making it possible for her to right. be comfortable. That it did. I think that it helped with some of the uh, keeping her sinuses and throat clear. It did work well for that, and that was the only thing that my mother would actually ask for. She didn't ask for pills and drugs, but occasionally she would actually ask for the colloidal silver because of the clearing effect that it would have on her throat. Okay, Brian, I know that she was pretty hard to care for at this point, but I think you had to call in some help. Uh, Is that right? Well, yes, we did have visiting nurses coming in uh, a few times a week. Okay, and what were they like? What were your experiences with that? Yeah, what were your experiences with that? Overall, in the last phase, when she was home and when I was using the feeding tube, I was getting a lot of negative comments about how bad off she was, as if there was something I should do. But we had just had her to the hospital. The feeling that I got was that they weren't very optimistic. They would comment about the way I was trying to feed her solid food, as if that was a dangerous thing for me to be doing. They always kept an eye on the uh, feeding pump, and certainly it didn't go without notice or comment that I wasn't feeding her the canned formula. We were using real food. That was a bad thing. They noted that that wasn't what was on the uh, the list of things that was to be done. They knew that we were changing things. They had to be very careful about what they said. I do remember at this time Brian calling us about one of the nurses who had, in the presence of his mother, said, I can see the writing on the wall. Any day now she'll die, was the implication. And, you know, his mother was right there, conscious. And this is the amount of care and compassion you get from these people. Well, it's something I've never actually forgotten, you know? Yeah, that does stick with you, doesn't it? It does. Generally, the nurses were discouraging. It was kind of tough to have them around because I knew that they were critical and uh, probably didn't really like what I was doing. No, they didn't want any deviation away from... Their standard of palliative care. Right, exactly. Uh Uh-huh. They were there to watch her die, not to save her. Now, if I remember correctly, one of the biggest snags we ran into when trying to help your mother was that she didn't have a a thyroid anymore. So she had a dependence on on Synthroid, the synthetic thyroid hormone. And you had trouble acquiring that. Can you tell us about it? Well, we were only sent home with a limited number of thyroid pills and we knew that we would have to find a new doctor to prescribe them. One of the nurses said she knew of a doctor who charged a thousand dollar upfront retainer but then would make house calls. Not really thinking that that was a very fair arrangement, my brother was able to help find a doctor in his area. I knew that I could take my mother there even though it was some distance because she always traveled very well. That's what we ended up doing. Unfortunately, we weren't very happy with the doctor. The doctor was cold, condescending, and had a disapproving attitude, even though we did everything that she wanted. It was as if she had a chip on her shoulder before we even got there. Really, the whole idea was that she would get a prescription for thyroid pills, and they would have to do a blood test in order to determine the dosage. Did the doctor have any reason to be disagreeable with you? I think that she had probably been given some information by the doctor that we had her to before from the nursing home, or maybe some of the other people. They would have had to have been in touch with her to forward her medical records. It was pretty clear that with her being so disapproving before we even walked in the door, I'm sure that she had to have been told that we could be troublemakers. Yeah, Yeah. it certainly sounds like you identified at this point. As a problem. Yes. Yeah. In their minds, apparently so. Please check us out and read our reports at the HealthWise Report website. You can find us on the internet at healthwise.org. 
Take special note that WISE is spelt W-Y-Z-E. We spell it W-Y-Z-E to emphasize wisdom. We are a not-for-profit organization, although we are not registered with any governmental agency. Nevertheless, we are a not-for-profit organization, so we always need donors to help us to continue our work, whether it be the equipment for these radio shows, our website and network infrastructure, various fees for our movie productions, and of course, the occasional video game to help us maintain our sanity through it all. You can also support us by visiting our online store. That can also be found at healthwise.org. And again, WISE is spelt W-Y-Z-E. We have to be careful about what claims we make about our products, including claims that can be verified, because we know of at least one governmental agency that would love to shut us down. We can tell you that our colloidal copper lotion has qualities that cannot be found in any other lotion sold. So if you have joint or skin problems of any kind, we recommend that you check out our lotion. You can also find our book, Defy Your Doctor and Be Healed, which contains our best work, condensed and re-edited into a nearly 600-page encyclopedia. It is the do-it-yourself guide to health, and it makes a fantastic gift. We also sell the HealthWise Antiperspirant, which is truly aluminum and petroleum free. We would not use anything else ourselves, because the competing products are atrocious, including the supposedly natural products. Thanks for listening to this. We'll get back to the show now. What happened next in the story? Before we go on to the next thing, I did want to mention that my mother really did improve quite a bit shortly after we started getting her real food. I don't want to underestimate her condition was dramatically better. She was actually beginning to speak and was in good spirits. And this is someone who was pretty much flat on her back, comatose in the nursing home. By the time we were ready to take her to the doctor, she really traveled very well. She seemed to really enjoy the road trip. She was helping me find road signs. And, you know, it really looked as if there was a good hope that there would be some degree of recovery. I remember clearly, Brian, that was a much more hopeful time. We had a a window there where it looked like we might actually win. We might actually be able to pull her out of this mess she had been put into. I think part of what helped her was the fact that Brian was following our Lyme disease protocol. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big part of it, you know, in addition to the nutrition. Unfortunately, we just really needed that synthroid. We really did. I mean, without because, that... Because her thyroid had actually been nuked. I mean, there was just... Yeah, it's kind of like all the herbs in the world aren't going to help if the patient's heart isn't working or the patient's lung isn't working and if the, the thyroid case. is gone. Mm-hmm. You need something to compensate for it. If the thyroid is not completely, absolutely obliterated, normally the animal stuff works better, the natural, but she was so damaged, I'm not sure you could have given her enough to really pull her out with the natural. It was yes. just that bad. Mm-hmm. And it's because of what they did to her. It didn't have to be this way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, she was lucky that she was getting any thyroid pills at all because we had to get her to this new doctor to get a prescription. And that obviously didn't go well. We didn't get it. And we were out of time. The only way that my mother got thyroid pills was because I was able to find all the old pills that she never threw away but put in the closet. We had to guess at the proper dose and how the pills would be ground up and put in the liquid that she was fed. We had to do the best that we could. It was tragic. We tried to make the point earlier about just how important the thyroid is. You can't just pull it out and not do anything about it. You can't kill it and not do anything about it. Without the thyroid functioning properly, eventually the heart will die. Yes. It's just that simple. And that is what happened in the end. Yes. I think there were a few more things you wanted to tell us about, Brian. Didn't you fire the nurses? The nurses who were brought in by the new doctor were a little bit disruptive because they were critical of what I was doing. I thought it was best if they stopped coming. You were providing alternative therapies to your mother, safe, natural alternative therapies. You were getting great results, and for some reason, that upset them? Uh, Yes. It's not as if these nurses even really knew much about my mother's condition. They were brought in 
We might have a different nurse every day, but anything that deviated from their standards or what they were expected to see seemed to bother them. Really, I was getting a lot of comments from people who didn't know anything about my mother's care. To me, that's what's astounding. You were bringing your mother back from the brink. People were seeing results, and that upset them. You eventually ended up firing them, right? Yes, I think I could say that. I asked them to stop coming. Yeah, and then, yet again, you got punished, didn't you, for being a bad troublemaker? Well, that did not set very well with her new doctor. Actually, the doctor hung up the phone on me at one point after she found out that I let the nurses go. I was expected to feel lucky that she was able to arrange those nurses for us in the first place. To let them go, I guess, in her mind, that was an unthinkable sin. Yeah, well, Brian, it sounds like to me the nurses weren't hired to come watch your mother. They came to watch you. I think that they were looking over my shoulder, and I really didn't care what they thought, but well, yeah, it's... after a while, it gets kind of disturbing when you are dealing with someone on a day-to-day basis, and you know that they're not approving of what you're doing. Absolutely, and it's it, your own home. It's like emotionally and spiritually training, when you've got the crew of witches there saying, let her die, you're the crazy one. During that brief window when they were there, watching your mom spring back to life for a short period, wouldn't you think that they would be jumping for joy, high-fiving, saying, we don't know what you're doing, but keep it up, instead of what they did? Oh, oh come Actually, all, that I, all that I got was comments about how bad she is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would think it would just be polite and decent to say, oh, you're, you're awake and talking today. That's good yeah. to see. I thought that I was being looked at with great suspicion all the time. And I think that at some point I really got tired of that, and that's why I had to let them go. The last useful thing that they were there to do was to take a blood test, and we never got the results from it. Okay, and, and to punish you... For firing the nurses, didn't the doctor call the local social services on you? Yes, she did. The social services aren't allowed to tell people who called, but it was pretty obvious in this case. (laughs) I ended up getting a visit from the social service people. They wanted to come in the house and check on my mother, which I let them do. At this point, I wasn't going to argue with them. After all, they helped a little bit in getting her out of the nursing home. They talked to her. They didn't see anything that they didn't like. Brian, I do want to hear more about the whole social services inspection thing. But at the same time, I want to go back just slightly to those nurses. If they really truly believed that it was hopeless, that there's no point in really doing anything for Virginia, then why did they have a problem with you giving her herbs and food? Sure, what, it wouldn't matter either way. Right? It wouldn't matter either way if she's going to die either way. Why would you're making her more comfortable and trying to do something? Why would that be a problem for them? You know, when you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, Brian, unless, you know, they're afraid you're going to succeed. That's the problem. They seem to have a presumption that the only person who's qualified to direct anything is the doctor. The doctor is their boss. They don't do anything but what the doctor tells them to do. And they knew that we were treating her differently than the doctors would have. You would describe them as somewhat like mindless drones, just following orders. Well, I think that really is their job, and they probably would be fired if they ever did anything other than that. I have a real problem thinking about anybody who is more concerned about getting fired than saving someone's life, especially someone who pretends to be a medical professional. I know in the past a lot of nurses have told us things that the doctors would not and may have been risking their jobs when they did it. I don't think that that's what was happening in this case. I think the nurses were just doing what they're told to do. We took this case very personally. Brian's mother. We hoped against hope that we might actually win. In the end, we didn't. We lost her because we believe it was the thyroid medicine that she was lacking. 
she needed that synthetic thyroid to keep her going. In case Brian didn't make this clear enough to everyone, he never got it. He never even got it after that blood test that was supposedly for it. Because at that point, he was being punished by his doctor, the same doctor called Social Services, who cut her off of the thyroid medicine, knowing, knowing full well that would kill her. And ultimately, it did. We got a call, I think, it, I don't remember, was it a Saturday? I don't remember. I think it was on a Saturday. We were going somewhere, and the phone rang just before we were headed out the door. And it was Brian. He was very concerned because Virginia was coughing and coughing up blood. We tried to stay calm, and we tried to keep Brian as calm as possible. We told him, get her to the hospital now, whatever it takes. Whether you could take her, the ambulance, any way you can get her to the hospital. This is a true medical emergency. I mean, Sarah knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. It probably meant heart failure. But it, it was too late. It was. Fortunately, because he got that DNR removed, they were willing to try. They, they at least pretended. They went through the motions. Yeah. Well, the but, ambulance crew gave it a shot. Yeah, they did the CPR and everything, but... It was too late. Virginia was gone. Well, it's not much more to say about that other than... It was sad. It was sad, and it was just the whole story is a long, tragic tale of all the different, well, a conspiracy by the medical establishment to kill her for a, an extended period at this point. Everywhere she I would in. say, if I could get something in here, it isn't even just all about death. Death is one thing, but the quality of her life for at least the last 10 to 15 years was absolutely terrible. I think that if we had done the kind of treatment that we did once we started using the herbal remedies and everything else that we did 10 or 15 years earlier, I don't know if we would have changed her date of death, probably, and maybe she would have had a decent life for, for 10 or 15 years instead of being an absolute invalid. Yeah, I am sorry that... Well, it, we simply were called too late. So we weren't involved, you know, 10 years beforehand. Of course, that was before health-wise. That's right. And back then, information was harder to come by than it is today. I don't think any of us have any regrets. We all fought a hard fight, and we did the best we could. Yeah. After Virginia passed away, Brian started Purevon, a company that sells colloidal silver. And it's called Purevon based upon, well, purity. You can find Brian at purevon.com. Now, tell me, Brian, why did you decide to start a colloidal silver business? I started the colloidal silver business because I saw that there was a huge need for colloidal silver because of the modern illnesses that people are getting. And I didn't want to end up the way my mother did where she had been perfectly healthy, suddenly got sick, and by the time we knew what to do about it, it was way too late to really help her. If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. I think that a colloidal silver business is just taking care of people's basic necessities, and it was a perfect extension for my career because I was a prototype builder I had worked with simple electrolyzers and electronic devices. I could see the colloidal silver generator was something that I could easily build. I also could see that the ideal colloidal generator didn't look much like the ones that were being advertised. So there was a need to find some reliable information about colloidal silver itself and the making of colloidal silver. Fortunately, I ran across that information in HealthWise's research. They had uncovered some scientific books from the early 20th century that covered colloidal silver and the research that was done on it, the trials, the effectiveness, and the safety of it. Those things were all well established 100 years ago, and I felt that that information was the most reliable that I could find, and that that's what should be used for the basis of making colloidal silver. I can't really argue with anything you've said. It sounds pretty spot on, to be honest. 
I would like to make one little minor tweak to what you said. What people don't know is that it's not really alternative medicine because it was practiced by the mainstream. It was, at one time, doctor-prescribed, and it was made by the pharmaceutical companies. In fact, one of those books, you know, that we found that survived the book burnings of yesteryear was a book by Alfred Searle, the founder of Searle Pharmaceuticals. So, really, when we're talking about silver here, we're talking about something that was very, very mainstream, that was at the core of the medical arsenal, that worked well and did things like kill viruses. And this goes way back. It was replaced by antibiotics eventually after the FDA threw silver out of the market after it got banned. And then it had its line of antibiotics. First there was sulfur type, then there were the mold-based antibiotics and so forth. And they didn't work as well. Actually, as a result, doctors lost their ability to kill viruses because of it, because silver was banned. To safely kill viruses, that is, without killing the patients in the process. Mm-hmm. I can't knock you, Brian. You said everything pretty true and accurate. But I think people need to realize that silver is not some fringe niche thing, that it was kicked out of the market for no good reason. There was no valid scientific reason. It was replaced by a more profitable system. And that's what it comes down to. Yeah. One other thing I want to mention that our listeners may not realize is that when you started this, you actually started it by necessity because you could not find a silver company with a good silver product you could trust to use on your mother to try to save your mother, nor could you find one that was really affordable. When you got the quality that's so bad and the fact that you can't afford it in the long term, you ended up having to do it yourself like you've done for so many other things like your herbs you gave your mom and the oxygen machine and all, you really did have to do it yourself to get it right. And I think now you found a way to turn that into not only a business, but a way to help your fellow man in the process, which we just have to applaud. Yeah, absolutely. I am always pleased to hear the good reviews and the good reports. That's something that amazes me, especially when People tell me that they order colloidal silver for their children or for their friends and other relatives and have it sent out of state. It is true that what I had been buying in the local vitamin store was just not the same colloidal silver that had been researched and tested 100 years ago, and the cost was ridiculously high, especially if you had to buy any amount of it, which you would need if you were using it for any specific purpose. Yes. Any serious disease or health condition, I'll say it for you, Brian, since you can't. We've looked around and around. What is on the market is atrocious. It's downright, when it, when it is effective, when it actually does something, it's not just water, it's atrocious. We're talking impurities all over the place, and most people actually make it out of silver wire from China. They don't even know what's in that metal. It really did amaze me when I looked around at what was being sold and even what I had been able to buy myself. The liquid that I was buying was brown. It looked like dark coffee. And I know now, which I didn't know at the time, I know now that real colloidal silver just can't be that color. We couldn't make it that color if we tried. It has to have something else in it or something had to be very wrong with the process in order for it to to look that way. And I'm surprised how many bottles I see advertised that are that color. I'm also kind of amused by all of the claims that are made about the fancy patented processes where the truth is that in that book that you mentioned, the Searle book, the information is pretty well laid out there. And that book, I believe, goes back to the 1920s. Anything that old can't be patented. Even if it had been patented at the time, the patent would have expired long ago. So there is no such thing as a patented process for making colloidal silver. If anyone has a patented process, then it has to be something crazy. I have read about high voltage arcing and all kinds of fancy terms like hydrazoles. I don't even remember them all fancy scientific terms that are used, and it all amounts to quackery as far as I'm concerned. Oh, don't we know it? And 
I'm glad you mentioned hydrosol because that's a term used with the most popular silver there is that's being sold in retailers. I believe it's Sovereign is the company selling it. How do you not make fun of that, Brian? When hydrosol, when you look it up, it means fluid, like water-based fluid. So in the case of Sovereign's hydrosol, which is such a good example, what's in there? Is there anything but water in there? I've gotten it, and I've looked at it and checked it out, and water is really like the only thing I can detect in that bottle. It, it does means, amaze me. I think yeah. hydrosol just, oh, it sounds very scientific, but it means anything that's wet, that's all. Yeah, it's like, it reminds me of the old Sertz commercials for Sertz breath mints. It used to say, with a drop of retsin. Well, retsin doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing. It's just a word they made up. Like, it includes gubawa. I mean, you could just make any word up. And that, that kind of reminds me of hydrosol. Yeah. And then they do the nanoparticle stuff, too, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, I remember a while back we got a call from somebody who was using colloidal silver, or supposedly colloidal silver, from Source Naturals. And we looked it up, and it had extra ingredients like EDTA. It was just scary. I didn't yeah. know what it was doing so, to that person. Once you chemically alter something by adding in other ingredients and mixing it together, how could it still be colloidal silver? You could mix milk and orange juice together. It's no longer milk. It's no longer orange juice. It's milk and orange juice, whatever we're going to call that. Colloidal silver really is supposed to be a very pale yellow color. That is a pretty good indicator that all is well with it. And I've found really that if anything at all gets into that liquid, it will change color right away. So if there's any contamination, it won't be pale yellow. When silver is its most safe and effective, when it's at its ideal strength of somewhere around 20 parts per million, it has that color that Brian is describing. He is exactly right here. But I do believe, Brian, aren't there some slight variations sometimes? Yes, there are. But I think as long as we have a golden yellow color, that is either very pale or a little bit darker, certainly not an amber color. As long as it's within that range, I think that is absolutely the best indication that there is. There aren't any instruments that will give us a better indication of what the strength of that liquid is or whether it is made properly. If we see that color, we know that it's good. Yeah. Well, I imagine if you worked for NASA, you could get access to those sort of instruments. But your competition out there who loves to boast about all their scientific testing, you know they're lying. Nobody has a Tyndall meter. Nobody has a spectrometer. Nobody has an electron microscope at their place. It is just ridiculous. They make these ridiculous claims, but it does come back to the color. Color is probably the simplest, easiest way to get a reasonably accurate measurement. In a sense, it's like using a pH strip. When you've got the right color, you know you've got the right value. Yeah. Silver is very consistent in that regard. I would say that it is. I think that we should look at something simple that way for what it is. I don't think that we need a giant laboratory to tell us whether the colloidal silver was made properly when we can tell that by looking at the color of it. Right, using the same method that was really used way back. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, the turn of the century, when these big pharmaceutical companies were doing it, They'd use a Tyndall meter on it. But the bottom line there is, they were still testing with light to see what kind of light it reflected. Mm -hmm. I don't think, Brian, you need a $200,000 piece of equipment to tell you when it's yellow. No, and we can do a Tyndall test with a red laser pointer. You're referring to the NEAT test where you put a red laser through colloidal silver and you can see the particles flickering, is that right? Yes, if... If you pour it in a clear glass and do it in a dark room, you can see the beam of light passing through the liquid, where if you have another glass right next to it filled with plain water, you don't see anything. Brian, the topic of colloidal silver might be new to some of our listeners, I'm sure at least for a certain percentage of them. What does it actually mean when you say colloidal silver? What is it? It's a suspension of very small silver particles in water. The water should be pure, so we use steam distilled water only. And the silver, of course, should be pure too, so we use the purest silver that we can get in bullion form, 
That way we bypass any wire that might have been made in China. We don't want to take risks like that. We have the small particles suspended in the water. And it really is a very simple electrolytic process. The silver basically breaks down in the water. It forms small particles. And the particles are small enough that their own electrical charge keeps them suspended in the liquid, and it overcomes the effect of gravity. The particles never settle to the bottom. So what you end up with literally is silver water. Silver combined with water. Silver water, yes, that really is what it is. But but not hydrosol, right, Brian? (laughs) Well, you could call it a hydrosol, but you really could call any kind of water a hydrosol. How do you get the silver to break down in water? It's just the electric current that does it. It's kind of like an electroplating process where the electricity is passed through two silver bars that are submerged in the water, and they break down and the silver is left in the water. I think some people may find it hard to grasp that these particles stay suspended like they do. And for me... The easiest way to think of it is kind of like a magnet. If you've got two magnets and you push two of them together, where both same we've got the same polarity on both magnets, they repel. You feel that that push against each other. Now it's kind of like that inside the solution, but it's surrounded by different particles all doing that. And they're all pushing away from each yeah. other, all equally repelling. It's the same. The same electrical charge on each particle is like all the magnets having the same polarity, so they all push against one another. Essentially, the particles that are lower inside the container are pushing against the ones that are higher and keeping them up in the air. I just want to make sure that people that, understood that. Mm-hmm. And that tends to give a perfectly even distribution. Because they're all being pushed by the same amount from all the different particles around them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And here's something else that's really neat. Under normal light, under normal conditions, you can't see the silver particles. There are actually pieces of metal floating in that water, lots and lots, millions and millions but you can't see them. They're invisible because they're so small. If you were to use a high-powered microscope to look at them, even in your yellow silver solution, they would be a different color. They're so small. The colloidal particles are so small that they're smaller than the wavelengths of light. Because of the way it breaks light, the yellow color is actually an illusion. Those particles aren't really yellow. It almost messes with your head to to just think about it. If you really start to study the science, it'll make your head spin. It's really neat stuff. I would say that they're not really yellow because if you spill some on your countertop and don't wipe it up, it'll leave a gray stain. That's true. In fact, we've made our own Brian, and whenever we've gotten plastic involved, like a plastic lid or something that's involved in the little bit splashes, we end up with gray and silver spots everywhere, even though you don't see that anywhere in the solution. And the particles are so small, they just like sink in really deep. You can't ever get that silver, that gray stain away again. Yeah, in fact, it's even stained one of our glass containers. It's actually stained the glass. The particles were so small, they sunk through the glass. And made an almost mirror-like effect. Well, they used to make mirrors with silver. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what they do now, but there are these sellers who boast about their ridiculous voltages. One of them was even bragging that he created a plasma arc in the water with like 15,000 volts, and that made his silver the best silver. When you're creating plasma, I don't think you're creating colloidal silver at that point. The truth is that really making colloidal silver is a fairly gentle process as electrical processes go. We don't want to deviate very much. The silver bars actually do dissolve very slowly. When you shop online for colloidal silver, You'll often find something called ionic silver. Can you tell us what that is? There have been a lot of questions about that, and that really is a source of endless confusion. Ionic silver just means silver that has smaller particles that don't meet the definition of colloidal, but have an ionic charge. The trouble with it is there isn't any way to know how much silver is in the liquid or whether it really is affected. And I I think that I've heard you mention some problems where the stomach acid might quickly devour particles that are that small. Yeah, it's 
really is very unlikely to even survive digestion. If it's not just water, it will be by the time it gets to your stomach. Yeah, and it looks like water, right? Yes, it would be completely clear. Okay. The three of us have gone over this topic endlessly and have studied it, it seems like, forever now. We know it backwards and forwards, and, you know, when we need it, we don't have to get it from you. We don't buy it from you. We we can just make our own at home because we just know the topic that well. Of course, anybody could do that. Anybody who's knowledgeable enough about the topic could make their own safe, effective, beneficial colloidal silver at home. I imagine some people will still choose to buy it because it's just what's well, a big inconvenience to go through the process. It's like most people would rather buy a cake than bake one. So it's just the way it is. What I find more interesting out of your stuff is your Burn Genie product. It came in handy one night. I got burnt and it really, really worked well. I found that there are a lot of bandages that have silver built in because of the way that it can allow for healing without germs. It works better than steroids for burn patients. Nothing heals burns better than silver because of its unique properties. It's naturally cooling because it's the world's best naturally occurring heat sink. People would want to have this in their medicine chest just as they would want to have activated charcoal for a poison emergency. It's the kind of thing that you would want to have on hand because When you need it, then it's too late. Not many people would want to wait around for it to come in the mail. Also, I found there are plenty of silver products available for burns, but you have to take a look at the ingredients list. A lot of them have things that you probably would not want to be using. Okay, so what are your ingredients? It's really very simple. It's based on colloidal silver as the liquid ingredient. And then we add concentrated aloe juice that's organic. And the combination of the silver and the aloe is an ideal burn-soothing agent. The only other thing added is something to thicken it so that we have a nice gel that can be easily applied. It's cool and it's soothing. But I think one thing that you should mention, because this is a big one, What's unique about silver is, and this is one of the reasons why it's used in so many burn centers, is because silver greatly accelerates burn healing. Nobody knows why. Nobody understands it. I mean, you can dig through the science to your blue in the face. It just does. But it just does. They don't know why. They don't know how. But it is absolutely miraculous what it will do for some burns. Yeah. And sunburns, too. I had a grease burn way back, probably seven years ago, and I think... A silver-based gel was really the only thing that would help. It just hurt, like, all the time. It just, well, it burnt, you know? Uh, that yeah. was, like, the only thing that would work. And silver just, well, like Thomas was yeah. saying, it just has some properties that nobody understands, and yet it's... A burn nervous. can be a very nasty thing, and they never heal very quickly on their own. Yeah, how true. Yeah. That's true. I would just say, if I were in Brian's position, I would do a lot more bragging about it than he's doing. Because it really is some awesome stuff. Yeah, I need to be humble about that. And, and he was right. When you need it, it's too late to buy it then. If you try to go order it then, you're going to be waiting for days in extra pain that you don't have to be in. Oh my gosh, I was so lucky that I had a little silver gel sample sitting yeah. around that one time when yeah. I got a grease burn. It was, it was hell mm-hmm. until I found that thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, there was no burn genie back then, though, unfortunately. Yeah. Still good stuff, though, right? Yeah, you gave it a good try. Mm-hmm. I'm always happy to hear when something works well. Well, I guess this is the end of the show, and we've been speaking with Brian Humphreys. He runs, operates, purevon.com. It's a website that sells his silver line of products, with his flagship product, Silver in a Bottle. And Purevon, in case you can't tell, it's spelt P as in Paul... U R E V as in Victor O N as in Nancy dot com. Listeners ought to know that Brian is limited in what he can tell you about his products, his colloidal silver. So if you want to know all the details of what colloidal silver is, how it's been used, its history, its benefits, etc., etc., come by our site, healthwise.org. Yeah, we you, have a big article. About we have a giant article there. You can read anything you'd ever want to know about it. 
If you want to learn more about how it's properly manufactured, we have a video on it called, I think, Making Genuine Colloidal Silver. Yeah. It's on YouTube. It's on our site. We are a great resource for learning all about it. But if you need to buy it, Brian is the guy to go to. Because, like I said, we've worked with him. We've communicated with him, monitored his results, and he has done outstanding. His is perfect. Yes. It, it is perfectly done. Just like it was done by the pharmaceutical industry years ago. Many, many years ago. Before it was ripped off the market. Yeah. And remember, if you need to find us at HealthWise, Wise is spelt W-Y-Z-E. So that's healthwise.org. Mm-hmm. Brian, we want to thank you for joining and being on our show. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Hopefully we'll be chatting again soon. And it is the end of our show. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. This is Thomas signing off. And this is Sarah. Toodaloo. Bye-bye.